So go ahead and just uh, give the camera your name and uh, connection with OLPC. I'm Mary Lou Jepson and I started OLPC with Nicholas Negroponte and was its first employee. And, um, and then, uh, how long ago was that? 2005, January. And what convinced you to, uh, to take that role? Oh, I thought it was a problem worth solving. Um, I was actually on my way to become a faculty member at MIT and met with Nicholas in his office in my, in my last interview. It was supposed to be five minutes. Three hours later, we had started One Laptop Per Child. It was, it was actually called the $100 Laptop Corporation at that time, and I flew to Europe that, that night, not back home to California to start it. I just thought, you know, why not? If, if, if I, people thought Nicholas was nuts to, to take this on, and I thought, what a great problem. If we can make this work, it changes everything. And I thought, why not apply what I can do to that mix to see if we can make it work. So I designed hardware, so that's what I did. And what was the moment that A, made you think it would work, and, and B, made you kind of uh, devote a lot of your life to it? Uh, the moment was when my husband, who's here, wrote a uh, paper called The Other Four Billion, talking about how it was clearly happening in 2002, 2003 in telecom. And I thought, boy, what if we could do it in digital? Because telecom is one thing, but if people, the whole world can now have access to computing, it can, it can change everything. And why not take what I've learned? I'm a, I'm a screen designer, actually, by, by training. And, um, but screens come with motherboards and mechanicals and so forth. And so why not take that knowledge I have and apply it to this, since everyone kind of universally thought it was a joke. Um, that is always what my grad school advisor told me. When they tell you it's impossible and start laughing at you, that means you're doing something interesting. <laughs> so anyway, I just, I, I guess fundamentally, I, um, 15 years ago I had a brain tumor. Um, every day I take lots of pills and shots and patches and stuff to, to stay alive. And so at the end of every day, in the beginning of every day, if I don't take those pills, I die. So I, I'm faced with that decision every day I live. Have I done something useful with my life today? And not every day is it yes, but I thought if I could work and continue to work on programs like this, maybe some fraction of that time can be useful to others with the skill set that I have. And then, um, speaking of that, uh, what are you just sort of your thoughts on the, you know, connecting children around the world and sort of what that means for the world? Is that any kind of a... Is it all technical, or is it what drives the technical if there is something? Men, most of the villages of the world are extremely isolated. Their world is the village. When they get the laptops that are connected, all of a sudden, their worldview changes. Their worldview isn't where, can, where one can walk in a day. Their worldview actually is communicating and seeing what's happening and different ways to think about solutions to problems, different problems. They can see the solutions and the problems created by the solution that opens up their, their, their ability to view the world and participate in that conversation. Children and adults and the entire villages are transformed when they get this, this, this connection to the rest of the world. And that is, is what I view as has been absolutely transformative of this project. It's also about hope, right? Where before it, you know, it looked like your greatest chance was to, you know, parents always want their children to do better than they are. And with the access to the computers and the much more opportunity, the children can go in many, many different directions that have been until now closed to them and were closed to their parents. So it's a great excitement of what this, this brings throughout throughout the world. And then for you, what was the hardest, uh, most challenging or difficult part of like the journey once you've decided to uh, take up this challenge? Well, I was the entire hardware team at OLPC for almost, for, num for the first two years. We got a few people later on. And to be fair, there was one person we got in the first year who burnt out. But I was on a flight and I went into adrenal failure on a 777. The emergency landed at 
and I nearly died because I couldn't keep these pills down I need to stay alive. And somehow I had to um, get back on those flights even though they were killing me. I was going around the world every three weeks for, well really for the last five years. And learning to live like that and maintain health is, is difficult. So the hardest part for me was maintaining my health um, while just completely diving heart and soul into this project. And I finally decided that that was also my job too, was to find a way to stay healthy um, while doing this. And that the balance was difficult because I think people fall love in love with this project, including the part about not being able to sleep at night, waking up in two in the morning, saying the kids have to get their laptops, what am I gonna do? Oh my God, they're relying on me. Every single person associated with this project feels that and falls in love with that project like that. And somehow, um, after the first year of that, they have to figure out how to also keep the other parts of their life going. And I think that was what was hardest for me and probably for others. I can totally relate with the idea of, of following it. What do you think of it, it is about the EXO that makes people fall in love with it? Oh, I think, it's, well, the EXO, did, we hadn't named the EXO when I fell in love with it. It was the $100 laptop corp. We were for-profit yeah. then. We decided to get non-profit. I think it's, it's the big dream. It's what we've been, it's, 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 the, it's the necessary conclusion of all this technology that was developed, you know, to fight World War II, really, computers and, and all of that. And it's the end game of it. It's, it's finally marching out to get it to, to, to people to transform. You know, if every kid could have a great teacher, fantastic. The truth is that it's a cheaper, simpler solution for the moment to get this technology out to them, um, to allow them to communicate uh, with the great teachers. They themselves are the teachers to each other. And so it really just turns everything on its ear if, if you can pull it off. And then um, what would you like to pass on from all this? the information or the wisdom that you'd like to? Uh... I think probably it depends on the audience. If people are watching this or saying, what can I do? I didn't know what I could do, but you know, maybe just be a little fearless and, and basically throw your hat in the ring and give it, a, give it a try. You can probably do a lot more than you might, you might be underestimating yourself. Um, and I think prior to this, I had, um, uh, maybe uh, had less confidence in my ability to to do things and I finally um, it took me maybe a long time to build up the confidence to try something as big as this and I'd say do it earlier in life just go for it um, if you see something that seems like something that you could fall I mean I think it's a key thing do the hard stuff but do the stuff you're passionate about that mix I'd say is, is probably you're in a good space there and that might not sound, that might only speak to certain people. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I think it speaks to everybody. <laughs> um, and then what's, you know, either the question you wish that people would ask you or the misconception you'd like to clear or the, you know, what, you, what is it that you'd like to say? I spun out of One Laptop Per Child almost three years ago to create a new company, Pixel Chi, to commercialize a lot of the technology. I developed, we developed uh, one laptop per child, particularly the screen and the low power architecture. And that actually was to drive the cost down because if you make a million or two million of something a year using the largest factories that have been ev ever been created for, for, for IT, the cost actually goes up and I'm trying to drive the cost down by getting getting the entire industry to adopt some a lot of the technologies we've developed. We've cross-licensed that with One Laptop Per Child, royalty-free. One Laptop Per Child gets access, gets free access to all of the intellectual property, all of the designs we invent in perpetuity at Pixel Chi. So OLPC is our charity, and I think a lot of people don't really understand that. Meanwhile, to drive volume, we sell the same components for profit to commercial companies. So it's it's our idea of how to get this to work. We're the, we're the first entity. OLPC was the first entity that got access to particularly the largest screen manufacturers in the world, the liquid crystal display screen manufacturers, 
The doors were closed to any external design before that, but based on Nicholas showing demand for tens of millions of units, credible demand, I mean, almost every head of state in the world was saying they wanted the screens en masse into their countries. I was able to get a foot into one of the LCD fabs. They did my design. It went from kickoff to mass production ready in six months, and based on that credibility, I've been able to get into to other fabs to create you know, the screen is the most power hungry and expensive component in a laptop and indeed in a tablet. It is the thing, you know, there's a back and there's the screen. And so you have to, um, that is the, the heart, if you will. It's how we interact, it's what we see, it's, it's how we interact with um, the, the device. And so basically the work we're doing at Pixel Chi is available free to OLC for that. And, we're working on ways to actually subsidize that from the for-profit efforts. And I think a lot of people don't know about that. Cool. Well, thank you.